Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be considering the spin wave theory of ferromagnetism. We're going to start with a basic model, the Hamiltonian given by the Heisenberg spin exchange Hamiltonian. We'll consider in this lecture explicitly a 1D spin chain, but this can easily be generalised to arbitrary uh, dimension and indeed arbitrary uh, connectivity or geometry of the lattices. Indeed, we'll also consider a situation with arbitrary spin s for the particles, not just spin half, but an arbitrary spin. The spin wave theory is a, a very uh, insightful and intuitive idea. What we start off with is a, a transformation of our quantum uh, spin operators into a new bosonic language with bosonic operators. This is an exact transformation in the sense that all of our um, spin operator commutation relations are preserved by the new bosonic operators. However, the exact transformation um, doesn't really get us any further. It's still a very complicated expression. So we then use a semi-classical approximation. This is where we go to the large spin limit. We take s to be something that's very large. We can then do a Taylor series expansion of our operators and truncate the series just retaining the first uh, leading terms. This gives us a bosonic Hamiltonian, which is then quadratic, and we can solve this using a simple Fourier transformation. This is a very insightful transformation because it allows us to understand the excitations of our system around the ferromagnetic ground state. These are called magnons, the excited collective modes of the system. They give us uh, a, a reduced magnetization um, from the uh, fully polarized ferromagnetic ground state at t equals zero, but at finite temperatures we have a thermal population of these excited magnons, and these give us like a magnetization texture in real space. And all of this can be calculated within the spin wave theory. Of course, this is an approximate um, solution. It's a semi-classical theory because we're considering this large s limit, but it gives us quite some understanding into the, the fundamental physics of the problem, including, in particular, these collective spin excitation modes. In a classical system, we have the fully polarized ferromagnetic ground state, and a single spin flip excitation would cost an, order j, an energy of order j, which is a large energy. We'll see, by contrast, that uh, in our quantum system in the thermodynamic limit, we can have um, these spin excitations with very, very low energy. Um, this is coming out from these collective excitations, each of which uh, correspond to something like each spin on the lattice canting very slightly away from its fully polarized uh, ground state position. But over very long length scales, you can get these textures emerging in the magnetization. These things, of course, have much lower energy than a single spin, uh, full spin flip on the lattice. And indeed, these are the things that are seen in experiments uh, on magnetic materials. So let's get down to work. In the previous lectures, we've been looking at quantum mechanical models of spin systems. In the last lecture, we looked at spin chains, and here is an example of such a model. In this lecture, we're going to study explicitly the 1D Heisenberg model. In 1D, this is of course just a chain of spin halves coupled to each other by this exchange interaction here, J, which exists between nearest neighbor spins. I'm going to consider it here an infinite system so the index i, labelling the spins here, runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we have an infinite number of spins in this chain geometry. On the right-hand side here, I've just written out the expression for the exchange interaction in terms of the spin operators along the z-direction and the raising and lowering spin operators here. In this lecture, we'll focus on the ferromagnetic situation. For the model as written, that implies that j is less than zero. We talked about some of the physics of this in the previous lectures. At the end of this lecture, I'll touch upon the anti-ferromagnetic situation, but the main calculations here I'll perform will be for the ferromagnetic case. I should also say right away that this is an extremely complicated model. We have uh, a system in the thermodynamic limit, meaning an infinite number of spins here, and we have, in general, strong correlations. We cannot simply set up a brute force diagonalization of this problem because, of course, we have many spins, and therefore the Hamiltonian matrix corresponding to this system will actually be infinite dimensional. Obviously, we can't diagonalize such a thing. In fact, there are exact analytic solutions to this 1D Heisenberg model. However, these require very sophisticated techniques. 
One of these uh, is called the beta ansatz technique, uh, but we won't consider that in this course. Instead, in this lecture, I want to talk about a, uh, an approximate method. This will allow us to get some simple solutions for this problem. It will also give us quite some physical insight into the fundamental physics. So the story I'll tell you here is certainly an approximate one, but it's a controlled approximation. We know exactly where it works and where it doesn't work and what the error is. But it really teaches us something fundamental about the nature of ferromagnets. In particular, we'll see that there are spin-flip excitations above the ferromagnetic ground state that become important at elevated temperatures. These are collective modes of spin excitations called magnons. We'll talk about the dispersion relations for these things and what they mean physically. First of all, let's write down the ground state of this system. At t equals naught, we have only a single accessible state. It is this uh, ferromagnetic state that I've written down here, in which all of the spins are aligned. As we discussed in the previous lecture, this actually represents uh, one of a family of solutions. The ground state of the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model, that's the one with j less than zero, is one in which all the spins are aligned. Here I'm choosing the axis of that alignment to be uh, in the up direction, but of course this can actually in reality be pointing anywhere in three-dimensional space. Indeed all of those uh, states are uh, degenerate, meaning they all have exactly the same energy no matter in which direction uh, the spins are pointing, so long as they're all pointing in the same direction. So when I write down this kind of state here, you should re really regard this as like a representative ground state. In the next lectures, we'll actually talk about broken symmetry and phase transitions, where we'll see that the system can really pick out a single uh, solution such as this uh, from the manifold of ground states. Although ferromagnetic states with uh, the spins aligned in a different direction have formally the same energy, the system kind of gets stuck in one of them, and then uh, it would require an enormous amount of time um, for the system to quantum mechanically tunnel from one of these degenerate states into the other. So although thermodynamically we have a manifold of uh, degenerate ground states, kinetically uh, it turns out that we basically just get stuck in one of them. That's the story for the next lecture. For now, let's just write down this ferromagnetic state here and take it as read that this is one of the representative states in our ground state manifold of degenerate states. The important take-home message is that it's ferromagnetic in the sense that all the spins are aligned in some arbitrary direction. Here I've picked the up direction. We know this is an eigenstate, and it's an exact eigenstate, because I can simply apply the Hamiltonian operator, as written, to this ferromagnetic state, and I would get the same state back again uh, with an eigenvalue, which is the ground state energy of the system. It's the lowest possible energy state, where the ground state energy here, we worked out in the previous lecture, is simply nj over 4, where n is the number of uh, sites in the system, which here is going to infinity. The energy of all the other states will be greater than this, they're excited states, and we should really measure their energy with respect to this ground state energy. Now, at finite temperature, t greater than zero, we get spin-flip excitations. As I had mentioned, these are collective modes called magnons. In some sense, these are similar to the collective lattice vibrations we see in crystals, which are called phonons. Here, instead, we have magnetic collective modes, called magnons. As with phonons, these magnons are also quantized. The aim in this lecture is to understand these collective magnon modes. We'll see how they're quantized, and we'll see what form they take in real space. Here, we'll see an illustration of something that is actually a common theme in condensed matter physics. We're actually not really interested in the full solution which tells us about the individual motions or dynamics of our electrons or spins. Rather, we're more interested in these collective modes. What are the emergent physics when you bring together a large number of these spins? We'll see that there is a magnetic spin texture, uh, basically forming spin waves. So here we're going to develop actually a semi-classical spin wave theory based on the so-called Holstein-Primakov transformation. So let me introduce this Holstein-Primakov transformation. The idea is that we want to relate our quantum spin operators of our Heisenberg model, meaning in this case, 
the uh, S, Z and S plus and minus operators for a given site J to some canonical bosons labelled AJ hat. So what are these bosonic operators here, these AJ hats? And indeed, what do I mean by a bosonic operator? By canonical bosons, I mean that we have operators that satisfy the bosonic commutation relations. That is, that if I take the commutator of AI with AJ dagger, I get delta IJ. This commutator is equal to 1 only if I and J are equal, otherwise it's equal to 0. This is exactly the same as we introduced in the very first lecture of this course for the quantum harmonic oscillator. In fact, that was one of the reasons why I talked about that then, so that we'd have something to foreground uh, the current discussion. In the context of the quantum harmonic oscillator, we saw that we had bosonic operators A hat and uh, A hat dagger. These things were ladder operators which created or destroyed bosons in a given quantum state. We defined a number operator N hat, which is defined as A dagger A, which counts the number of bosons in a given quantum state. We can define basis states labelled according to the quantum number nj, which is the occupation of a given quantum state j. And then we see that the state nj is an eigenstate of the nj hat operator with eigenvalue nj. This might seem a little bit convoluted and indeed tautological, but what I'm trying to say here is that we can define an operator n hat which counts the number of bosons in a given quantum state, and we can actually use this to label our states. These occupation numbers are good quantum numbers to describe our basis. In the context of the quantum harmonic oscillator, we saw that the state with um, zero bosons was the ground state, and that excited states were states with a higher occupation of these bosons. OK, so how can we use these bosonic operators to describe spin systems? Well, our quantum mechanical spin operators are of course defined by their spin angular momentum commutation relations, which I've written down here. However, there's a big difference between these spin operators and the canonical bosons. The commutator here for the spin operators S plus and S minus yields as its result another spin operator. This is rather different from the canonical bosons, where the commutator of two operators does not yield another operator, but simply a number. The fact that for spins, the commutator of two operators yields another operator makes it much more difficult to work with these operators than with the canonical bosons. We'll see that it's actually easier to represent our spin operators in terms of these uh, bosonic operators and then work with those instead. The way of doing this is through the holstein primakov representation. The idea is to express the spin operators on a given site J in terms of canonical boson creation and annihilation operators AJ dagger and AJ. Let me first write down the representation, and then we'll discuss the form of it. Let the spin raising operator on site J, SJ plus here, be equal to the square root of 2S minus NJ hat, multiplied by the operator AJ hat. The corresponding lowering operator, SJ minus hat, is equal to AJ dagger times the square root of 2S minus NJ hat. Notice here that the expressions for S plus and S minus are Hermitian conjugates of each other, as they should be. SJZ is equal to S minus NJ hat. Together, these form the holstein primakov representation of our spin operators. Recall that eigenvalues of the S squared operator for a given site J is SJ into SJ plus 1. Furthermore, eigenvalues of the SJZ operator, which are labelled by the quantum numbers SJZ, run from minus SJ all the way up to plus SJ in integer units, meaning, of course, that there are two SJ plus 1 values. We can see from these expressions directly that the expectation value of the number of bosons in a given site J must be less than or equal to 2S. If the eigenvalue of NJ hat was greater than 2S, then these square roots would become negative. Notice here I've used the fact that the maximum value of an expectation value of some operator is given by its maximum eigenvalue. We can see directly that if we apply the spin lowering operator, SJ minus, to a state with uh, 2S bosons in state J, then we'll get zero. This is because we have the square root of 2S minus NJ, 
and if nj returns the eigenvalue 2s, then this gives us zero. Likewise, we can see immediately that the raising operator s plus, acting on a state with zero bosons, nj equals zero, gives us zero. That's because here we have this aj at hat operator, which destroys a boson in state j. Let's remind ourselves of uh, these operator relations. If I act with aj uh, plus on a state uh, nj, then it increases the number of bosons to nj plus 1. If I act with aj on the state nj, then it reduces the number of bosons to nj minus 1. However, this only applies for nj greater than 0. If nj is equal to 0, then I cannot remove any bosons from this state because there are none there to begin with. This zero state is therefore referred to as the vacuum, it's the one with zero bosons, and I can't further reduce the number of bosons in such a state. Therefore, according to the definition of S plus here, which has this leading AJ operator, if I act with S plus on a state with no bosons, I will get zero. So the minimum number of bosons is zero, and the maximum number is 2S. And therefore, we see that nj can take uh, 2s plus 1 different values. This is exactly what we had for the z component of the spin in our original problem. sz can take 2s plus 1 different values. So we see already here that there is a mapping between the number of bosons here, nj, and uh, the spin projection of our original model, sjz. This is confirmed by looking at the form of the sjz operator, which is given by s minus nj. If we look at the state uh, nj equals 0, then obviously this will give us sjz is equal to s. That is the state with the maximum sj. On the other hand, if we pick the state with nj is equal to 2s, then when we apply it to this, we will see that we get sjz is equal to minus s. This corresponds to the state with the minimum sz. So all of this makes good sense. However, that's certainly not yet the end of the story. We need to confirm that the expressions for our quantum spin operators here, in terms of our bosonic operators, satisfy the correct spin operator algebra, as encoded in these commutation relations. So let's try that out now. So let's now have a look at the commutation relation between the S plus and S minus operators we know that this should give us the SZ operator, actually 2 times SZ. We also know that the S squared operator gives us eigenvalues S into S plus 1. Here I've dropped the site label J on all of these operators. This is just for notational simplicity in what follows, but later on we're going to reinstate these labels. We'll just imagine that everything we do here holds for every single site J. So what we want to do now is use the holstein primakov transformation, which I've written again here, to confirm that these operator relations really hold true. The first step is simply to write out what this commutator means. It means s plus s minus minus s minus s plus. Now we will simply substitute in these expressions for s plus and s minus from our holstein primakov transformation. When I do that, I get the following. Immediately, I can see that these two square roots here are for the same object. They give us 2s minus n hat in total, and they are sandwiched between an a hat operator and an a hat plus operator. What about this term? Here in the middle, I have a, a plus. Taken together, these don't change the number of bosons. Let's say I had n bosons in my system, I apply a plus to it, I get n plus 1, but then I apply a to it, and then I get back to where I started. The state will again have n bosons. This means that I can actually commute the pair of operators a, a plus through this square root term here. That's because the square root term just has a constant 2s minus the operator n hat. But as I've just indicated, a, a plus doesn't actually change the total number of bosons once we apply both of them together. So that tells us that n hat and a, a plus commute. That gives us the following expression. a, a plus into 2s minus n. Here again, I multiplied these uh, two square roots together. Minus a plus times 2s minus n times a. Let's now have a closer look at this term n hat, a hat. 
Imagine that I apply the operator n hat a hat to a state with n bosons. I'm representing that by this ket n. First of all, I act with a hat. That reduces the number of bosons in that state, assuming here that n is greater than zero. So then I have n hat acting on the ket n minus one. This, of course, gives me n minus one as the eigenvalue times the ket n minus one back again. Do n and a commute as operators? Well, to confirm that, let's simply apply a hat n hat to the same state n. First of all, we apply the n hat operator to our ket n. Obviously, that gives us an eigenvalue of n. And then I can apply my operator a hat to the state n. In the end, this gives us n into the state n minus 1. a hat acting on n gives us the state n minus 1. So we see that these two operators, n hat and a hat, do not commute. The result of these operations is not the same. We see, in fact, that n hat a hat is equal to a hat into n hat minus 1. I can actually get this same result by considering the product of n and a, where n is, of course, itself equal to a plus a. So I have this triple product here. I can now use the commutation relations for a plus and a. They tell us that a with a plus is equal to 1, meaning, of course, that a plus a is equal to a a plus minus 1. So if I substitute this in, I find that n hat a hat is equal to a a plus minus 1 into a which can then be written as a hat into a plus a minus 1, which is, of course, exactly what we wanted, where we recognize that a plus a is equal to n hat. This gives us precisely this relation. Plugging this back in and doing a simple bit of rearranging gives us the following expression. Here, I can factorize this in terms of the commutator between a and a plus. I get the commutator of a and a plus times 2s minus n hat minus a plus a. But remember, a plus a is, of course, the definition of our number operator, n hat. Furthermore, we know the value of this commutator for canonical bosons is equal to 1. Therefore, overall, we have 2s minus 2 n hat, which is precisely 2 times the operator sz, according to our definition here. So this correctly satisfies the commutation relations for the spin operators. The commutator for s plus and s minus gives us twice sz. Let's take a look now at the operator algebra for s squared. I can write this in terms of operators involving sz and operators s plus and s minus in the following familiar form. I can now simply plug in these relations as before. I now find the following expansion. The first term, sz squared, simply relates to s minus n hat all squared. And then I have a half of s plus s minus plus s minus s plus. When I plug these expressions in, I get the following terms. Of course, these are very similar to the terms we've just been analyzing. Notice, however, that before we had a minus sign here because we were looking at the commutator. Here we have the sum of these two terms. In this case, we get the following. To be able to compare these two terms, we need to swap the order of these operators. In this term, I have a plus a. In this term, I have a a plus. Here, I'm again going to use the commutation relations for the a's, which tell me that a with a plus, the commutator, is equal to 1. That, of course, tells us that a a plus can be written as 1 plus a plus a. So I can swap the order of these, uh, but I get this extra plus 1 here. So writing that out, I now obtain this expression, where I've used that a plus a is equal to the number operator n hat. 
To obtain this expression, I simply multiplied all of this out and recognized that n hat times n hat is equal to n hat. It's an idempotent operator. And all of this can be factorized into s into s plus 1. This is the correct relation for the eigenvalue of our s squared operator. So we've seen here that the holstein primakov representation of our spin operators in terms of these bosonic operators faithfully reproduce the commutation relations, as well as this operator identity for s squared. So the holstein primakov representation is one that satisfies all the requirements. I will show you in the next slides how this can actually be used in a useful way. You might worry that these operator expressions here are very complicated. How can we really make use of this in practice? Although these expressions are exact, I'll now turn to a simple approximation which holds in the semi-classical limit. This will allow us to make some progress and actually find some useful physical information about real systems. So on the previous slides, we established that the holstein primakov representation of our quantum spin operators in terms of these bosonic operators, A and A+, plus, is an exact representation. It gives us all of the desired operator algebra for our original quantum spins. However, we also saw that the expressions were rather unpleasant, and it's a bit hard to see how we can really use these things to make progress. And therefore, even though we derived uh, an exact representation, we're now going to break this. We're going to consider an approximation. To do this, we'll consider the so-called semi-classical limit. That's basically shorthand for saying the large spin limit. To motivate this, let's remind ourselves that the eigenvalues of the s squared operator are s into s plus 1. Of course, this can be exactly factorized as s squared into 1 plus 1 over s. In the large s limit, formally here I mean s goes to infinity, we therefore see that the operator s squared just gives us the number s squared back again. This is the classical result for a vector spin of length s, rather than the quantum mechanical spin. What I mean by this is that if the spins were just classical vectors of length s, then the square of their length should just be s squared. Instead, in the quantum world, we see that there is a correction factor, 1 plus 1 over s, which is due to the quantum nature of the spins. So we refer to the large s limit as the semi-classical limit, because we're treating the spins basically as if they're classical vector spins. So now we're going to use this large s limit to do a Taylor series expansion of our spin operators, and then we'll truncate the series, neglecting everything other than the leading terms in 1 over s. So to do this Taylor series in powers of 1 over s, we're going to first of all factorize out uh, a factor of square root 2s here. This will leave us with the square root 1 minus n hat over 2s. And this latter object will therefore be our small parameter that motivates our Taylor series expansion. And we see actually the expansion will be in powers of n hat over 2s. When we do this, we obtain the following form. We have square root 2s into 1 minus n hat over 4s plus terms of order n hat over 2s squared. Likewise, uh, in a very similar fashion for the expression for s minus. As said, we don't need to do any expansion. So these are exact expressions, but now I'm going to cross out and neglect these terms of higher order in n hat over 2s. I'm actually going to neglect everything uh, of order n hat over 2s squared and higher. So the expressions we'll actually use will be these ones written in blue here. I've done this for an arbitrary spin, but we imagine on our Heisenberg chain um, that each of these uh, quantum spin operators here has a label J for a particular site labeled J. And likewise, our bosonic operators on the right-hand side will similarly have labels J. Before we go ahead and insert these transformations into our original Heisenberg spin model, it's worth commenting that the ferromagnetic ground state of the Heisenberg spin model is actually the vacuum state in terms of bosons. What I mean by that is the following. Consider the ferromagnetic state. Here I'm picking the one with all of the spins parallel and pointing upwards. I can expand this out as a product state with an upspin in site 1, an upspin on site 2, an upspin on site 3, and so on, all the way up to uh, site number n. And of course, we're taking the thermodynamic limit in the end of n going to infinity. But now we have to be a little more careful because we've generalized from spin half to an arbitrary spin s. And indeed, we're taking the limit of large s. So for a quantum spin s, 
What I mean by the up arrow here is the so-called extremal weight state. I mean that we've got a spin s, but the sz is equal to s. It's the highest possible sz for a state with spin s. That's what I mean by the up arrow here. It's called the extremal weight state because the sz is taking its maximum or extremal value. So, in terms of our bosonic system, the state with sz is equal to s, from this expression, tells us that n is equal to zero. The extremal weight state for a given site j is the one with zero bosons. If we then go back to our many particle system, the ferromagnetic state with all of the spins uh, aligned is the extremal weight state of our entire system. It's the state with the maximum possible sz in the total system. I can therefore write that state in terms of uh, zero bosons in the first site, zero bosons in the second site, zero bosons in the third site, and so on. The ferromagnetic state of our spin system is therefore equivalent to a system with zero bosons anywhere in the entire system. We refer to this as the vacuum state. It's the state with the lowest number possible of bosons. We can create excitations above the ferromagnetic ground state, therefore, by adding bosons to this vacuum state. These bosons will go into one or more of the sites labelled J. But, as we'll see, um, the eigenstates of the Heisenberg spin model will not be product states in our bosonic system. They'll be quantum superpositions of such states. So this is actually one of the most important features of the holstein primakov representation. We've seen that the ground state of our Heisenberg spin model, which is the extremal weight state, actually is one in which we have zero bosons in our system. So the ground state is the one with zero bosons, and each boson that we add therefore represents an excitation. This is an extremely convenient formulation of our problem in terms of bosons. We also see that the magnetic excitations are quantized because they're represented by these bosons nj. The eigenstates, in terms of our bosonic system, we'll see are collective modes. It will give us some physical insight to analyze what these look like. All of this motivates the use of our uh, semi-classical approximation for the large spin. A natural guess for the low-energy excitations of our spin system would be that they just correspond to small collective oscillations of the spins around the ordering direction, which here we've taken to be the z-direction. Thus, these oscillations, which are called spin waves, make the expectation value of the z-projection of the spin on a given site j less than the maximum value s. In terms of the holstein primakov representation, this means that the boson number and the expectation value on a given site of the number of bosons is non-zero. If this boson number is much smaller than the, uh, the value s, uh, which is the maximum value it can take, then the reduction in uh, the expectation value of sz is small. So this means that we have a very weak oscillation. Therefore, one might expect that um, an expansion in a small parameter proportional to nj over s would make sense. One could expect this to work better um, the larger the s, since uh, there we'd guess that increasing the s would make this parameter smaller and smaller. So this is really the motivation for using our large s expansion and then truncating the series uh, to get the operators that we've written down here. Notice that these operators are in a simple form. We're utilizing this large s limit, but they also now do not satisfy um, the, uh, the spin commutation relations that we verified for these full expressions on the left-hand side uh, earlier. So these full expressions do satisfy the, the spin commutation relations. This is the exact representation. When we perform this Taylor series expansion and then truncate the series, we obtain these things. Actually, these do not uh, any longer obey the uh, spin commutation relations. So we can see, of course, that this is going to be, in the end, an approximate solution but it's one that will give us quite some physical insight, and I've given the motivation for doing it, so let's get on with it. So, now it is finally time to insert our holstein primakov representation of our spin operators into our Heisenberg-Hamiltonian. Here I've written out again the Heisenberg model that we'll use. We're considering an infinite chain with site indexes i that run from minus infinity to plus infinity. And here I've written it out in terms of the z and plus minus spin operators. Underneath in red, I've recapitulated 
the Holstein Primakov representation in the large S limit, where I truncated the Taylor series expansion of these quantum spin operators in terms of these bosonic operators. For a given site J, I have uh, bosonic operators A, J, and A, J plus, and corresponding number operator N, J. This is the final expression when I substitute in these operators into the Hamiltonian. I will leave it as an exercise for you to confirm this. And this is the result correct to order uh, s to the zero. So I would have, in principle, higher order corrections in 1 over s, which here I'm neglecting, in the large s limit. The terms I've written down are the leading terms, and those are the ones that we're going to analyze. The terms we threw away would actually involve four or more of these bosonic operators, a and a+. Plus. They would correspond to interactions between the different bosons, and we're not going to consider those here. These interaction terms are suppressed by at least a factor of 1 over s compared to the non-interacting terms, which I've written down here, and which are proportional to s itself. And the hope is that uh, the perturbations to the non-interacting limits that I've written down here would be small because those interaction terms are suppressed by this factor of 1 over s, which becomes small uh, when s itself is large. The idea is that we can neglect these to a first approximation um, we're treating those as weak perturbations to the non-interacting theory. There's a few things to notice about this expression. Uh, I've done some sort of tidying up and collected some terms, but one term that survives is this term here, s. Notice that this is just a constant. We're talking about spins s. s is just a number. So this term can actually be neglected because um, in the end this is just a constant term in the Hamiltonian, that doesn't affect the overall dynamics of our system. It's not going to tell us anything about the collective modes or the eigenstates. Those eigenstates uh, will be independent of whatever constant we pick here. That's fundamentally because the Schrodinger equation is a differential equation and doesn't care about these kind of constants. Secondly, let's look at these final two terms. This one is clearly the definition of the number operator for site i, ni hat. And likewise, the last term is equal to the number operator for site i plus 1. But notice that we're summing over all sites i. So we'll get a contribution from a given i uh, from this term, and then from the next i from this term. So I can actually absorb both of these terms together um, because we're summing over all i. Tidying everything up, I then obtain this final expression. This is the 1D Heisenberg chain written in its bosonic form using the holstein primakov representation in the large S limit. This is what's referred to as a tight binding model of bosons. We'll actually study tight binding models of fermions in great detail in the second part of this course. For now, I'll simply uh, mention that it's referred to as a tight binding model and leave it at that. The important point is that this model can be solved analytically exactly using a Fourier transform. This diagonalizes the Hamiltonian and thereby solves the Schrodinger equation. And that's what I'll be showing you in the coming slides. So here is the model that we wish to solve. It's the Heisenberg chain uh, transformed into this bosonic form using the truncated holstein primakov representation. We will now perform a Fourier transform of the real space operators A hat X into momentum space operators A hat K. X labels the real space index, and K labels a momentum. In this expression, we have uh, the system size n appearing. n is the total number of spins in our original system. Here, we'll use periodic boundary conditions. This means that the operator Ax is equal to the operator Ax plus n. We imagine, uh, rather than a chain of spins, that we connect the last site up to the first one again to make a ring. Thereby, we have a periodic system with periodic boundary conditions. Every site in the system is equivalent to every other site. This is convenient because then we don't have uh, effects due to the boundaries of our finite chain. In the end, we're going to send n to infinity, but in the meantime, we'll use this discrete representation with a finite system size n and a discrete sum over k. From our expression of the uh, Fourier transform of these operators here, it's clear that the periodic boundary condition implies that e to the i k n is equal to 1. Therefore, we can let the momenta k be equal to 2 pi p over n with an integer p. 
For a system of size n, we therefore have uh, n discrete values of our momentum uh, parameterized by this integer p. By convention, we usually choose this p to run from minus n over 2 to plus n over 2 in these integer units. This then defines momentum in the first Brillouin zone. All of this is, of course, in one dimension along the x-axis, but of course we can generalize this to arbitrary dimensions in a very similar way. In that case, we just have periodic boundary conditions in each of the dimensions, and then we have a corresponding momentum along each of our directions. We will make use of the Fourier identity here, that 1 over n times the sum over all x of e to the i k minus k primed x is actually the delta function, uh, delta k k primed. What this means is that this sum collapses uh, to 1 if k is equal to k primed, but it's 0 otherwise. This is an extremely important and useful equation because using it, we can prove that the bosonic operators in the k space satisfy the correct commutation relations. And we get this because, of course, our original bosons in the x space satisfy the canonical commutation relations for bosons. So because we start off with canonical bosons, we end up with canonical bosons, which both satisfy the correct commutation relations. This confirms that the Fourier transform here um, of our operators is a so-called canonical transformation. It's canonical because the commutation relations of the operators is preserved when doing this transformation. To be able to calculate these expressions, I also needed to know the, uh, the expression for the a plus that is obtained just by taking the uh, conjugate transpose of this expression. So here, recall that a x plus is equal to a x dagger. Therefore, the same holds true in our k space. And the dagger symbol means taking the conjugate transpose. OK, so let's now just go ahead and substitute in these expressions into our Hamiltonian. We will, of course, also need the A plus operators. Uh, as I just mentioned, they are the conjugate transpose of the A operators. And therefore, within this expression, we have the sum over k of e to the minus i k x. Because we have the con complex conjugate, um, the i's turn into minus i's and the a's turn into a pluses. With these two expressions, we can now just substitute it in our Hamiltonian, and let's see what we get. Because the Hamiltonian is quadratic in these a operators, meaning that I have pairs of them here, that means that I'm going to have a double sum over k and k primed. Uh, I'm not allowed to use the same index twice, so for the first operator, the aj dagger, um, I use uh, the label k, and then when I'm moving on to a j plus 1, I use this expression, but I have to use a different label, a dummy index, k primed. So that's what I get when I expand it all out. I have a double sum over k and k primed. Um, and then I have all of these terms involving these operators, a k plus and a k primed. I also get a bunch of these exponential factors. Notice that these exponentials are just numbers. They're not operators and therefore we can commute them through the operators. In particular, if we look at this last term here, we see that we can factorize these, um, these exponentials into a single term, e to the i, k primed minus k times j, times these operators. But also notice that we have a sum over all j out the front and a factor of 1 over n. And this object is, as we said on the previous slide, an identity uh, delta k k primed. And then we multiply it by these operators, where now, because of the Kronecker delta here, I've set k equals to k primed. This collapses the sum over k and k primed, and just picks out the single value where k is equal to k primed. We can play a very similar game with this middle term, for example, here. I have 1 over n, the sum over j, times these terms. Here, I get, I've again pulled out this exponential factor that's going to correspond to our Kronecker delta. But it doesn't quite work out in these first two terms because, unlike this last term where we have j and j in the exponentials, 
here we have j and j plus 1. So this extra plus 1 here I can factorise out as a separate term, e to the minus i k primed times 1, which is this term. So we see something a bit different in these first two terms. We see a term that's obviously going to give us a Kronecker delta, but then we get this extra piece here. This first term will give us delta k k primed, then we'll have e to the minus i k, and then a k plus a k. This first term gives us something very similar. However, notice that this time uh, we have e to the plus i k primed rather than e to the minus i k primed as we had before. All of this might look a little bit complicated. It's important you just write it out yourselves and have a play with it, stare at it for a while, and then you'll see that this whole thing uh, simplifies uh, rather dramatically to the following. Now I've absorbed the sum over j and these exponentials into the Kronecker deltas, and because I have a Kronecker delta of k k primed, in both cases, in all terms, in fact, this collapses the sum over k and k primed to a single sum over k. All of the operators then become diagonal, they have the same label k. And what I'm left over with is a factor of minus 2 from this last term, a factor of e to the i k from this first term, and a factor of e to the minus i k from this second term. Again, all k primes have been set to k. We recognize e to the i k plus e to the minus i k is 2 times cos k. This whole thing can then be written in terms of the sum over k times uh, simply a k plus a k times some uh, k-dependent energy. This epsilon k here is referred to as the Magnon dispersion relation. The dispersion tells you how the energy of a given momentum state is related to that momentum. In this case, we've derived it exactly. We found that epsilon k is equal to 2js into cos k minus 1. The dispersion relation tells us how the energy relates to the momentum, and we see it here written out explicitly. In particular, note that the minimum energy of this is 0, and that happens when k is equal to 0. If I put k equals 0 in here, I get cos 0, which is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, epsilon k is 0. If I look at any finite k, I will see a positive energy from this expression. Remember, it's a positive energy because j itself is negative. So let's unpack what we're seeing here. We've managed to map the Heisenberg Hamiltonian into this perfectly diagonal form. Of course, this is using the semi-classical large S approximation within the Holstein-Primakov representation, but within that approximation, uh, we have this simple form. What it tells us is that the energy of the system can be basically found by counting up the number of bosons in the different k states and then multiplying by their respective uh, boson energies, epsilon k. And we know how the uh, boson energies, epsilon k, relate to the momentum k through the dispersion relation, which we've uh, derived explicitly here. The ground state energy um, is here equal to zero. Of course, this is not actually the ground state energy. We've thrown away uh, constants as we've been going through this calculation. One should rather regard this Hamiltonian as telling us what the energy of the excitations are on top of the ground state. So relative to the ground state, the uh, ground state is at energy zero. And uh, if we want to look at the energy of excited states, we simply put bosons into this system. And uh, the lowest energy excitations are the ones, as you can see from here, um, with the smallest k. And as we put more and more bosons in, and as we put them into uh, momentum states with higher and higher momentum, we'll get higher and higher excited states. They will have an energy that you can just obtain simply by adding up these single particle energies. The energy is related to the number of bosons in each of these ak modes. These ak modes are themselves the magnons. They are the collective magnetic excitations of the system. Just as we derived these kind of bosonic operators from our quantum harmonic oscillator model, we can see that this system is basically just a bunch of independent harmonic oscillators, each labelled by a wave vector k. The quanta of the harmonic oscillators are called magnons, and they're quantized. They're quantized spin wave excitations, just like phonons are quantized lattice vibrations in a crystal. A magnon with a wave vector k costs an energy epsilon k, which is greater than zero, 
The ground state, with zero energy, has no magnons. None of the bosonic sites in our mapped system have any occupation. We can therefore write that the expectation value of nk hat in the ground state is equal to zero. At zero temperature, we therefore expect the total number of bosons in the system to be zero. This matches with our expectation at the beginning when we were talking about the ferromagnetic state being the extremal weight system, which is the vacuum of our bosonic system. So this all tallies perfectly with what we're finding here. But when we go to finite temperature, we'll see that some of these bosonic modes will be occupied. This will give rise to a finite bosonic population and therefore a finite magnetization of the original system. Or rather, I should say, a finite deviation in the magnetization from the fully polarized ferromagnetic state. At t equals zero, I can write down the ferromagnetic ground state with all spins aligned in the positive z direction. I can write this in terms of the vacuum state of our bosonic system and simply write that nj expectation value is equal to zero at zero temperatures. This actually also means that the expectation value of nk is equal to zero. Have a little think why that might be the case. Um, we can see actually that doing a basis transformation uh, does not change the, the value of these expectation values. And that's because, of course, we're doing a canonical transformation. To see this, simply note that nk hat is equal to ak hat plus ak hat. It's an exact analogy to the number operator in our real space, nj hat. At non-zero temperatures, we'll see that magnons will be thermally excited. And indeed, we know what the population of those states is, because we have um, a simple non-interacting bosonic gas of particles. We can simply use the expectation value of the number operator nk as being given by the Bose-Einstein distribution function, which I've written out here. That involves the energy of the state uh, k, which we know it's given by epsilon k. So at finite temperature, different modes will have different occupations according to this Bose-Einstein distribution. We will therefore get in total a non-zero bosonic occupation, which will therefore change the magnetization of the system. Let's write down the average magnetization of a given site, 1 over n, the sum over j, with the expectation values of the sjz operator. Using the holstein pumikov transformation, we can write this as s minus 1 over n sum over j of the expectation value of the boson number operator. And again, we can do the transformation from our real space j to our momentum space k. So we indeed see, using this um, Bose-Einstein uh, distribution expression here, that as we increase the temperature, the thermal expectation of these uh, number operators uh, will increase and that they will actually reduce the overall magnetization from the maximum possible value of the magnetization per site, which is s. The amount by which it's reduced is simply related to this expectation value of nk hat. This all makes eminent uh, good sense physically. We start off at zero temperature with our fully polarized state with all the spins pointing up. And as we increase temperature, we get uh, some spin flip excitations where some of the spins end up uh, down, and this reduces the overall magnetization. Now we have a fully quantitative understanding of how that happens. We can also understand something by looking at these modes. If we look at a given uh, mode k uh, with an operator ak, um, this will tell us about uh, the, the basically the wave functions of those excitations. Although uh, we've written the Hamiltonian in this diagonal form in terms of k, we can, of course, express our uh, diagonal modes at ak in terms of our real space modes aj and really see what's going on in terms of the spin configuration in real space. So let's have a look at that. So we see that these magnon modes are collective spin excitations. This means that uh, the spins would all be pointing in their up direction with a, a maximal SZ component on average in the ground state. But as we go to finite temperature, we excite some of these uh, excited magnon modes. These have on average a lower uh, magnetization 
And this is because the spins are becoming cantered and going away from their maximum value of SZ. And in time, that means that they're pr processing around this value of the maximum SZ. And then we get these kind of spin textures in real space. We can understand and obtain these by expressing our AK operators in terms of our original uh, real space AJ operators. We do this, of course, using the inverse Fourier transform. So these Magnon modes are really Fourier modes. Although high energy excited states might involve essentially a single spin flip uh, in this way, that actually costs quite a lot of energy. And so the low energy excited states are really these kind of collective modes where each spin only deviates very slightly from its ground state value. But when we look over uh, real space, we see these kind of magnetic textures beginning to appear. Although a single spin flip like this costs of order J energy, these collective modes can actually have arbitrarily low energy in the thermodynamic limit. That's because in our uh, dispersion relation for epsilon k, uh, if we have very small values of k, meaning very long wavelengths, then we have um, a situation with a very, very l low energy excited state. So in our macroscopic system, we're able to have uh, excitations which are very, very low energy compared with single spin flips that you might imagine in the classical system. Of course, we can also extend this to higher dimensions. For example, let's take a look at the 2D square lattice. The ground state is again the ferromagnetic state with all of the spins pointing up, but we can consider the low energy collective excitations, the Magnon modes, in this system, and they look a bit like this. Indeed, we can get all sorts of exotic magnetic textures depending on the material, for example, this is a so-called magnetic skirmion. Spin wave theory therefore gives us a simple and intuitive picture of how to understand magnetic textures in real materials. Finally, I want to briefly touch upon spin wave theory for antifarad magnets. This is a little bit more difficult because, of course, the Nael state, the up-down, up-down state, is not actually the exact ground state of our Heisenberg spin chain model. Furthermore, we have to do the whole calculation assuming a broken symmetry situation. This is the way we divide up our lattice into sublattices A and B, with spins on sublattice A pointing up and spins on sublattice B pointing down. We then need to do, uh, do our spin wave theory separately in each of these sublattices. We will then find collective Magnon modes for the upspins and the downspins. However, the details of this are a little more complicated, and so I won't go into it explicitly in this lecture. So, to summarise, in spin wave theory, we represent our quantum spin operators in terms of canonical bosons. We did this here using the holstein primakov transformation, but actually there are also other methods which I didn't cover. <clears throat> the ferromagnetic ground state is then the bosonic vacuum. We then use a semi-classical approximation of a large spin S. This allows us to truncate our Taylor series expansion of the operators in 1 over s and find a tractable solution. This uh, also makes some physical sense because we're considering the low energy excitations around the bosonic vacuum, which is the ferromagnetic ground state. We then can diagonalize the quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian using uh, a Fourier transformation of the operators. Uh, we can then look at the Magnon modes. These are the AKs and the dispersion relation, which tells us how a given Magnon mode uh, has an energy related to its momentum. In the next lectures, we're going to consider spin systems and broken symmetry and phase transitions.